Perhaps the flakes of light had settled in my eyes too when Yolandi's web had fallen around me. Sitting still and waiting, watching the sunset, I hadn't thought much about the way the shadows fell and moved. It was always easier when I was motionless myself, but I saw him clearly this time. I saw him, and not merely by a process of elimination, one wiggly shadow moving in a specific direction. He was a dark figure, human-shaped, vampire-shaped. He was Khan. A dark figure, dark with glints of gold as if light flakes fell on him, sparked like struck matches and fell away. Did I hear him or not? I don't know. I had a feeling like sound of him, as I had a feeling like sight. I saw him disappear around the corner of the house. He would be coming up the stairs now. I felt his presence there. He would be opening my door. Hmm. Did he open doors to walk through them? No, wait. Vampires couldn't disintegrate themselves, I didn't think. A few sorcerers could, but they were the really crazy ones. If you've invited a vampire across your threshold, maybe the door simply didn't exist for him anymore. Or anyway, why did the front door always whoosh gently when I opened it, but not when he did? And I knew when he was standing behind me, it wasn't that I heard him breathing, but the vampire in the room thing was unmistakable. I stood up and looked around and turned around. He looked different. It might have been the light flakes, but I don't think so. I probably looked different, too. If you're going into what you know is your final battle, maybe the preliminary loin girding always is visible. My experience is limited. I don't know that I would necessarily have identified the way Khan looked as a vampire prepared for his last battle, but as a thumbnail description, it would do. I was always surprised at how big he was. That's probably something about the way vampires move, the boneless gliding, that human spine unhinging creepy grace. You didn't believe it, so you made the vampire smaller in your memory to make it a little more plausible. Uh, I don't know about the generic you in this case. So far as I knew, I was the only human so far who'd had the opportunity or the need. It's funny. Vampires have been a fact of human existence since before history began. And yet in our heart of hearts, I don't think we really believe in them. Every time one of us meets up with one of them, we don't believe in them all over again. Of course, in most cases, a human meeting up with a vampire is looking at their immediate death, and so not believing it is the last forlorn hope. But I'm here to say that being acquainted with one doesn't lessen the feeling much. I didn't believe in Khan. Tricky. I believed in my own death more. I stretched my hand out and put it on his chest, where no heart beat. He was wearing another one of his long black shirts. It might have been the one I had worn a few nights ago, except that that one was hanging in the back of my closet with the cranberry red dress, my vampire wardrobe. I let my hand drop. But he reached out and picked it up. There was a fizz, a shock as his skin met mine. I felt him twitch ever so slightly, but he didn't lose my hand. He turned it over instead and then laid it gently, as if it had no volition of its own, in the palm of his other hand. The invisible spark happened again, but he didn't startle this time. My back was to the fading twilight, but in the shadow of my body the occasional gold glints of the web were just visible. What is this, he said. Yolandi gave it to me. She said it would help me draw on the source of my strength. Daylight, he said. Yes, does it hurt you? No. I thought about that no. It sounded a little like the no of the kid playing so-called touch football, who has just had the three biggest kids in the neighborhood tag her by knocking her down and sitting on her. They asked me after they let me up if I was hurt. I said no. I was lying. Let me rephrase that. A small shiver in his breath, really quite a human noise, audible breath with a catch in it, like a muted laugh. When you are a little too hot, a little too cold, does it hurt? Old Mr. Temperature Control, I thought. What do you know about too hot and too cold? No, I still wasn't thinking about any of that. Delete that thought. Or if you pick up something a little too heavy for you, does it hurt? It is only a little pressure on the understood boundaries of yourself. I liked that, a little pressure on the understood boundaries of yourself. It sounded like something out of a self-awareness class, probably with yoga. See what kind of a pretzel you can tie yourself into and press on the understood. I was raving, if only to myself. I took a deep breath. Okay. 
My new light web was to con no worse than hauling an overfull sheet of cinnamon rolls out of the oven and making a run for the countertop before I dropped them was to me. I looked into his face, dully lit by the last of the twilight, and realized with a shock that I had no doubt. The shadows there lay quietly, too. Ready, he said. I smiled involuntarily. Are you joking? Yes, I said. I have taken what you showed me and measured it by the ways I know. I believe that between us we shall attain our goal. Our goal, I thought. I didn't translate this into practical terms. We do not travel in your nowhere's ville, but I fear the way we are going is nonetheless unpleasant. I will need your assistance. It will not be easy both to travel that way and to guard our presence from too early detection. I closed my eyes, hurling myself into this, to stop myself from thinking about it, took a firmer grip on his hand, and began to search for the alignment. This was very different from the fuzzy, non-telephone line I had used to talk the con. For that, I could just go to the edge of whatever it was that was out there and grope. This was more like walking through a snake pit with a forked stick, hoping you could sneak up behind the snake you wanted and nail it with the stick before it nailed you. Meanwhile, hoping that none of the other snakes saw you first. I glanced apologetically at the ever so slightly like the back of a snake pattern glinting faint gold against in my skin. I said one of my grand's words. It was only a little word, a little word of thanks and of settling, settling down, settling in. But I thought the light web might like it. Then I closed my eyes again. There. This may have been the light web too, or it may have been that I'd now done my compass needle maneuver several times and was getting the hang of it. Or it may have been con. Some of it was con. I could feel the faint, scritchy buzz of connection through our palms. There seemed to be a variety of paths laid out before us. There was the totally eviscerating,ly worst, the slightly less worse, but worst enough, the still really bad, the only basic deadly dire, and probably a few others. I was looking at the Catherine wheel glitter of the way that had blown out SOFHQ and at the looming thing that was our destination as Khan arranged us on the boundary of one of the other, the quite awful enough thanks ways. The glooming thing and its guardians didn't look so much like an aquarium this time, or if it did, those fish were sick, more like the special effects in one of those post-Holocaust movies. Any moment now, the ghastly mutants would come lurching on screen and wave their deviant limbs at us. I wished it was a movie. Come, said Khan, and we stepped forward together. By the time we'd walked off the edge of the balcony, we were firmly, if that's quite the word I want, into other space. Vampires probably can bound lightly down from third stories, but I didn't want to try it. As it was, I was immediately having a precarious time keeping my feet. There didn't seem to be any up or down, although this is a good thing when you've just walked off a balcony, or sideways, or backward, or forward for that matter. Other than the fact that we had backs and fronts, and our faces were on one side of us rather than another, this path, whatever it was, was a lot worse than Khan's short way home the other night. At least I had feet, which was an improvement on Nowheresville. Hey, not only did I have feet, I got to keep my clothes on. I could still see the looming thing that was what we were aiming for, and since I didn't know anything about the protective detail, I assumed that my function was to keep watching it. Khan propelled us, presumably forward. He seemed to know up from down and sideways from sideways. I felt things whiz past me occasionally, and while I couldn't have told you what they were, I could guess they weren't friendly. Every time I set my foot down, it seemed to resolve the place I was in a little more, as if my invading three-dimensionality was making my surroundings coagulate, and little by little there seemed to be another sort of stepping stone system after all, 
Although redder than the ordinary world, sluicing by between the stones, it seemed to boil up and, beca and become part of the no up, no down, no anything else. I felt as if I would like to be sick, but fortunately my stomach couldn't figure out which was up either, so it stayed where it was. After some kind of time, there began to be half-recognizable ordinary things in the careening entropy. A street lamp, a corner of a dilapidated building with a revolving door, one of whose panes was broken, a stop sign, a road sign, Garrison Street. We were in no town. As we went on, on still used advisedly, we flickered more clearly into no town. Sometimes we took a step or two on broken pavement as if we were actually there. Maybe we were. There were now other people sporadically present also. I didn't like the look of any of them. We passed several nightclubs with people wandering in and out. There were bouncers at the doors of some of them, but that mostly wasn't the style in no town. If you could walk, you could walk where you wanted to. Even the seriously flash Spartan clubs, the places where people who lived in downtown high-rises went when they wanted to feel like they were slumming, but were still willing to pay 30 blinks for a short glass of wine to prove they were slumming only because they wanted to, had more subtle ways of getting rid of you. Meanwhile, outdoors, if you fell down, you lay there, and people still ambulatory stepped over you. And people still ambulatory stepped over you. Horizontal bodies are part of the ambiance. Maybe you got rolled while you were lying there being ambient. Maybe you got taken home for dinner, to be dinner. It wasn't a good place to linger in for anyone. Anyone alive, that is. But there was another myth that if you were high enough, the suckers would leave you alone because your blood would screw them up. I don't think this is something I'd want to rely on myself. There are narrow do wells among the others like there are among us humans. And my guess is there are suckers who have developed a taste for screwed up blood. Also, if you're hungry enough, you'll eat anything, right? And the still breathing body face down in the gutter is real easy to, you know, catch. I was having trouble staying upright as we winked back and forth between worlds. If when visible I was staggering a little, I would fit right in. I was a little afraid I might see someone I knew. Gods and angels never underestimate the power of social conditioning. Even under the circumstances, when I was fully expecting never having to face or explain anything to anyone again, after the next few minutes or hours or time fragments splintered by chaos space, I was worried about this, that I might see Kenny, or his friends, or some of the younger, dumber regulars at Charlie's, or even what remained of a few of the guys my age I knew who hadn't got back out of drugs again. What was I afraid of? That they might see me too, holding hands with a vampire? That I would look as if I was merely under the dark and going to the usual fate of a human seen in the company of a vampire? I was supposed to care. I didn't know what any humans might be making of us, but I began to see vampires looking back at us. I didn't have any trouble recognizing them. I didn't know if this was because they weren't bothering to try to pass, or if I just knew a vampire when I saw one these days. I didn't notice when the first one did more than look, when the first one came at us. I didn't notice till Khan had, never mind. He did it with his other hand, and with the hand that helped mine jerked us back into chaos space. He wiped the splatter of blood off his face with his forearm, except there was blood on his arm, too. I was afraid I'd see him lick his lips. I didn't. Maybe I didn't watch long enough. Maybe, you know, used blood isn't of much interest. My hand trembled, at, trembled in his, in the hand of my lethal vampire companion. I was alive, human, with a beating heart. I was all alone. The next time there were several of them, this time Khan jerked us out of chaos space because he then had to let go of my hand. I was glad I didn't have to find out what would happen if I got left there alone without him. I wasn't glad for very long. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. 
note to myself, in my next life, get some martial arts training. Get a lot of martial arts training, just in case. Again, as with the first vampire who attacked us, something happened quicker than I could follow, quicker than I wanted to follow, and I yanked my gaze away, afraid of what my dark vision might make out for me. There was blood, again, but there was also at least one vampire left over while Khan was otherwise engaged, and he was looking at me. I looked at him, not thinking about anything but my own terror, my eyes wide open, open so wide that they hurt. He met that gaze. Hey, he knew a human when he saw one, and he knew he was a vampire, and I saw him falter, and then Khan had turned from whatever he was doing and took care of that one too, too fast for me to look away. I think I probably cried out. Jesse wasn't going to rescue me this time. I wasn't going to come to myself with human arms around me and a human voice shouting in my ear, it's all over, you're all right. There was now quite a lot of blood and bits and pieces. I had blood on me too. Khan seized my hand again and said sharply, come. I didn't dare look in his face. There would be no comfort, no reassurance in the face of any vampire. When I took a running step to keep up with him, my shoes slipped in the blood. There was so much blood on our hands that as it dried, our fingers stuck together. The meaty smell was a miasma, a poison gas. We didn't duck back into the chaos space. I had half forgotten my alignment, but it was now as if it was tied to me or I was tied to it. It was pulling us along through, those, through these dark, broken streets where the shadows lay twisted and crumpled like dead bodies pulling as if we were on a leash. I wanted to untie it, but I couldn't. I mustn't. I wanted to, no, it was too late. Even if I had funked it now at the last minute, after the last minute, all it would do now is get us killed, sooner. I could hear them, someone, keeping pace with us. Why didn't they close in, cut us off, attack us? Khan said quietly, as if there was no urgency whatsoever. Bo will not be able to say your name, either of your names. What? Sunshine? Ray? Daylight names? Old vampires can't say daylight words either. The very old vampires that can't go out in the moonlight that is only faint reflected sunlight. The academics would have said Khan counted as very old, and he didn't even wait for full dark. Twilight was good enough for him, and he called me Sunshine. There are different ways of being what we are. Apparently, Bo hadn't aged so well, something to talk to the academics about. Variability of aging among vampires, usage of certain words pertaining to daylight by aged vampires. Maybe I could get my pass into the other museum's library after all. No, wait, I was about to die. I didn't immediately see what good Bo's not being able to say my name was going to do me. Bo wasn't going to need to say or know my name to kill me. Okay. Names are power. We'd had that back at the lake. Big deal. Things are more power. We'd had that at the lake, too. Khan had chosen to let me go. Bo wasn't going to. Why had I agreed to this, anyway? You feel the pull strongly, Khan went on in that infuriatingly calm voice. Bo has connected to our presence here. If we are separated, go on. Follow that connection to its end. Leave me. I will catch up with you when I can. Oh, good. I was so glad he would make the effort to catch up with me later. Although I wished he'd use the word goal or aim rather than end. I recommend, he added, dispassionate as ever. I was trying to remind myself that he always sounded unbothered, not to say dead. Or maybe that it was a good sign he sounded so unflapped now, as if this was still all part of the normal range of vampire activities. I almost didn't hear the rest of what he was saying. You do not attempt to retreat into any other space, including the way I have brought us both. You would only draw some of those creatures after you, and their advantage there would be greater than yours. Right. Like it wasn't greater than mine everywhere. I realized that while we were no longer in the chaos space, we weren't exactly in no town either. Or at least I hoped it wasn't no town, because if it was, our human world was in even more trouble than most of us knew about, than I knew about. 
Again the thought came to me, what did I know? Pat said a hundred years tops before, and the people who came to no town for frills weren't likely to notice that the whole scene was sliding over the edge of normal reality into. I felt the pull strongly all right, like a hand around my throat that was slowly tightening. If I was a dog on a lead, I was wearing a choke collar, and my master didn't like me much. Maybe it was that sense of pressure that made my vision go funny, but then my vision had been funny for two months now, and I was kind of used to funniness. But this was a new kind of funniness, where things seemed to dance in and out of existence, rather than merely in and out of light and darkness. There were streetlights where we were, some of them still worked, and great swaths of darkness. There was the uneven pavement under our feet, the potholed roads, the crumbling curves. Once I stepped unawares on a manhole cover, and the sound this made, even in this night of horrors, made my heart leap into my throat. There were tall buildings that seemed to prowl among the shadows. A few of them had dim lights burning that gave the old peeling posters on their walls an undesirable life. Huge painted eyes winked at me, fingers as long as my legs beckoned to me. The way the clubs leaped out of the night with their noise and bewildering lighting, stabbing and erratic, rhythmic and dazzling, rainbow-colored or this week's fashion match, heightened that sense of utterwear. Hey, I wanted to say to some of the humans we passed, you don't need drugs, let me tell you. There are spaces between worlds. There are master vampires that loop invisible ropes around your neck and drag you to your doom. We are running through no town. I hear our footsteps. No, I hear my footsteps and the kind of unmatched echo that chills your blood because you know it means you're not alone and what you're not alone with isn't human. I remember when hearing and seeing were simple. It had to do with sound and light and the manageable equations they taught you in school. I'm wondering if anyone notices us. The only kind of running that goes on here is the furtive kind. No joggers out to burn off last night's burger and fries or reach the buzz of an endorphin high. No one hearing running footsteps, especially running footsteps with an unmatched echo, is going to look up if they can help it. I guess I can stop worrying about seeing someone I know. A few people do look up, though. Bad consci consciences, old habits, a momentary or drug-induced forgetfulness about who or where they are. I think I meet the eyes of one young woman. I see her take me in, take Con in, disbelieve us both, and then we're past her, running out of the light surf back into the ocean of darkness, into a fresh sea for vampires. They didn't want to connect with me, lucky me. I winced and twitched out of the way of anything I saw, anything I half saw. I stopped trying to see anything and let my instinct, whatever instinct this was, keep me moving. Where was Con? No. I still knew him from the rest of them. For one thing, he was the center of the thief. If there's only one guy on your team, he's the one everybody else is jumping on. It went on in a horrible almost silence. There was a hot circlet around my neck and across my breast. There were two small fires burning in my two front jeans pockets. Apparently they'd learned their lesson that first time when the sun sword had hit the pillow. They didn't set my clothes on fire this time either, and it wasn't because they weren't really putting it out. They were. The evening we'd blown SOF HQ wasn't even a dress rehearsal for what was going on now. Even with my talismans going full throttle, my luck didn't hold for long. Something, someone, crashed into me, tore me away from Khan, out of the sea. It was taking me somewhere. It was, in fact, the same direction I was being dragged by my invisible leash. But I didn't feel I wanted any help getting there sooner. Besides, whatever Khan had said about going on without him, I'd rather not, thanks. I saw a shape and ducked away from it. It seemed a little uncertain of its own bearings. It missed its grab and teeth ground down my arm, strangely fumbling if teeth can fumble. Hey, my jugular is up this way. I wished for a nice apple tree steak, well impregnated with mistletoe, except I didn't know how to use it. Staking takes training. The table knife had been a one-off. I put my right hand in my pocket, braced the butt end of my hot little knife against my palm, and pointed it up between my fingers, not with the blade open, just the hard, blunt end of it, like a single fat brass knuckle. I saw it momentarily, shining like a tiny moon, just a slightly misaligned gemstone in a ring. 
Then I swung it with my paltry human strength up in the general direction of where the base of the breastbone that belonged to the teeth in my other arm might be. I connected. The wide blunt end of my knife sank in. As it did, it blazed up, no longer moonlike, but sunlight. Golden, shining, a tongue of flame, and in its light I saw a golden lattice extending up my arm. I had just time to remember what had happened in an alley when I had used a table knife. The noise was different. There was no narrow alley walls for the gobbets to smack against. Instead, I heard the thick, heavy splats like loathsome rain as they fell around me. I'd forgotten the smell, the smell of something long dead and rotten. I thought, they're not even a little human anymore when they explode. They shatter so easily, like throwing an overripe melon against a fence. No melon ever smelled like this. Khan rematerialized from wherever he had been, from whatever he had been doing. I just managed not to wince out of his way, too. The problem was he looked like a vampire, and at the moment he looked a lot more like a vampire than he looked like Khan. One of the even more comforting than usual stories about vampires is that sometimes, during vampire gang wars, for example, they go into berserker furies and tear anything they can get their hands on apart, not only their enemies, but their comrades, the guys on their own side. Supposedly, the berserker fit can last quite a while, and if a particularly effective dismemberer gets to the end of the bodies around it before the fit wears off, it will tear itself to shreds, too. Maybe this is a consoling story when you're at home with a book or reading it off your comm box screen. The idea that there are many fewer vampires in the world, that they had done each other in while we humans cowered safely behind closed doors, with a hell of a lot of wards nailed over them. If you find yourself so unlucky as to be living somewhere there is a sucker war going on, you pin a lot of wards around your house, and you do not go out after dark or before dawn for any reason. I didn't know what a vampire running amok looked like, but it might have looked like Khan. It wasn't just, it wasn't. Look, if you ever have the opportunity to choose between being eaten by a tiger and bitten by an enraged vampire, take the tiger. I was probably off in my feeble little human, she's in shock, wrap her in a blanket and get out the whiskey space. Humans don't deal with extreme situations very well. Our pathetic bodies freak out. We freeze and our blood pressure falls and we can't think and all that. I stood there staring while Khan snarled and showed me his teeth and didn't offer me the blanket or the whiskey or the hot sweet tea. Then, maybe he remembered I was his ally, maybe he'd remembered that but had momentarily forgotten seeing me as soaked in blood and sprinkled with the remains of a mutilated enemy as he, that I was a mere human. Maybe the snarl was the vampire equivalent of hot damn, well done. Whatever, he stopped snarling and drew his face together. When he seized my slimy hand and pulled me along after him again, I didn't give her, I didn't collapse, and I didn't throw up. I stuffed my knife back into my pocket and went. I wish I could forget how it feels, your hair stuck to your skull with blood, foul blood running gummily down inside your clothes, invading your privacy, your decency, your humanity, till it chafes you with every breath, every mo movement, the tug of it as it dries on your skin, feeling like some kind of snare, blood in your mouth that you cannot spit the vile taste of away. I think I must have gone into some kind of berserker fury myself. There are things you don't want to know you can do, aren't there? But if you're lucky, you never find them out. I found out too many of them all at once. I, who had to leave the kitchen at Charlie's when they were whacking up meat into joints or putting slabs of drippy, pulpy, maroony red stuff through the grinder. Blood stings when it gets in your eyes, and it's viscous, so it's hard to blink out again. It may not only be because the blood stings that you're weeping. I have always been afraid of more things than I can remember at one time. Mom, when I was younger and still admitted to some of them, said that it was the price of having a good imagination and suggested I stop reading the Blood Lore series, which was past 30 volumes even then, and maybe retiring a mortal death and blow Hellkeep from the top bookshelf for a while. I didn't, but it wouldn't have done any good if I had. Reading scary books is weirdly reassuring most of the time. It means at least one other person, the author, has imagined things as awful as you have. What's bad is when the author comes up with stuff you hadn't thought of yet. I thought it was bad when I was just reading stuff I hadn't thought of, and even then I'd known that sometimes it's worse when the author leaves it to your imagination. 
I stopped using my knife. I found out I didn't have to. I found out I could do it with my hands. It was still mostly con that we got through. Even warded up the wazoo and covered in bright gold cobweb, I was still only human. I was still slower and weaker than any vampire, but I had con, and I was warded and webbed, and the vampires didn't like tangling with me. They kept choosing the tangle with con, even though they could see graphically what had happened to the last vampire, or twelve, or twenty-seven, or four thousand and eight vampires that had tangled with con. If we ever got to the end of all this, haha and so on, and wanted to find our way back out of the maze, it wasn't a thread we would have to follow, but a path paved with undead body parts. Maybe they thought they'd wear him out or something. I still got a few. You'd think offing a few va vampires would feel like doing a community service, wouldn't you? It doesn't, not even when they don't explode. That's why I started doing it with my hands. They didn't explode, I discovered, if I merely jammed my fingers in under their breastbones and pulled. My vampire affinity. I lost track. There was gore and gruesomeness, and then more of it, and I hated all of it and was ready to be killed just to get away from it. If someone would promise me, cross their heart and hope to die, very, very funny, that I wouldn't rise again in any semblance. I still wasn't sure about the mechanics of turning, and it seemed to me that dying in the present circumstances probably wasn't the best recipe for staying quietly in my grave afterward. Supposing someone found enough of me to bury. I would have liked to give up. I meant to give up, but I couldn't. Like, I couldn't stay at home and hide under the bed, I guess. Maybe it was promising Khan to stick around as long as I could. Stick seemed the right verb under the circumstances. Every time I lifted one of my blood clotted shoes, there was a sticky ripping noise. And then everything went quiet, at least except for the noise I was making. Mostly it was just breathing, maybe bleating a little. One of the things that had happened during the business of savaging our way through Bo's army was that I'd begun to know where Khan was, like I knew where my right hand or my left leg was. It was a bit like unwrapping something from swaths of tissue paper, or following an idea through its development to a conclusion. You have an inkling of something, some shape or concept, and it gets clearer and stronger till you know what it is. It happened while the occasional shrieks and dead flesh noises went on, all those near misses with my own death. I understood that I was crazy, crazy to be still alive, crazy to be doing what I was doing to stay alive, crazy to be trying to stay alive. This knowingness about Khan was a strange island in a strange ocean. That sense of Khan's presence, of his precise location, had undoubtedly saved my life several times in the carnage, if it hadn't done much for my sanity, but it meant that when things suddenly went quiet and I felt someone, some vampire, coming noiselessly up behind me, I knew it was Khan. Well, well, said a silent voice from an invisible speaker, this meeting has been much more amusing than I anticipated. I didn't have to hear Khan snort. He didn't, of course. Vampires don't snort, even with derision. But I knew as Khan knew that the voice was lying when it said amusing. I also knew who this was. Bo, Mr. Beauregard. The fellow who had got us in all this. The fellow we were here to have the final meeting with. Him or us. I was pretty sure things had only started to get amusing, even if they hadn't gone quite as Bo had expected so far. And while I knew vampires didn't get tired exactly, I knew that they could come to the end of their strength. I'd seen Khan coming to the end of his out at the lake. I didn't know how one evening of tearing up your fellow vampires limb from limb matched against having been chained to the wall of a house with a ward sign eating into your ankle and the sun creeping after you through the windows every day, day after day. But I doubted Khan was feeling bright-eyed and bushy-tailed now. I sure wasn't. I was missing my nice, sympathetic human emergency room tech saying, There's nothing really wrong with you. We're giving you a sedative, and you can go home. I was also so tired that the weirdness of my dark vision was starting to bother me again, like new shoes that aren't quite broken in yet that you've been wearing too long. I couldn't tell how much of what I seemed to be seeing was happening, and how much of it was my overstressed brain playing tricks on my eyes. I stared around, trying to make sense of what I was. Okay, not seeing. It was dark in here, wherever it was. When had it become in here? We'd started out on the streets of No Town, more or less. 
Well, we weren't there anymore, given the mess. I was glad no humans were likely to stumble across us. I tried to settle down, settle back into my skin, except I didn't want to be in my skin anymore. I didn't want to be me. I didn't want to know me. But the animal body was overriding the conscious brain, the brain that ground out concepts like worthwhile and not worthwhile. My medulla oblongata was determined to stay alive, whatever my cerebrum said. For a moment, I seemed to be floating up above myself, looking down at the bloody wreckage, at the two figures still standing, Con and me, standing next to each other, facing in the same direction. When Bo spoke again, I snapped back together, body and mind. I could almost hear the clunk as the bolt slotted into place, trapping me with myself again. I may have hated and feared myself now, but I hated and feared Beauregard worse. Welcome, welcome. Do come in. Welcome between us. Connie has been a curious affair for some years now, eh? I imagine you haven't been too surprised. Perhaps you explained it to your companion. I hope so, Connie. It would have been rude of you to omit explanation, I feel, and you have always been the soul of courtesy, haven't you? Your little human Connie is very enterprising. She has been nosing around me for some little while. I'm surprised, Connie, that you would allow a human to do your, shall I say, dirty work. You must have found your experience a few months ago more debilitating than I realized, or perhaps more corrupting. And I thought Con's laugh was horrible. I blanked out when Bo laughed, like you blank out when you're conked on the head. It's not a voluntary response. Maybe I should have been insulted that I was being ignored. I wasn't. I didn't want him to say anything to me. The mere experience, I won't call it sound of his voice, was like having the skin peeled off me. The skin I hadn't wanted to fit myself back inside a few moments ago. Very, very distantly it occurred to me that if I was feeling a little brighter, I might find it funny that Bo seemed to be accusing me of being a bad influence on a vampire, but I wasn't feeling brighter. Oh yes, I am here waiting for you. Do keep coming on. After all, you have worked quite hard to progress so far, have you not? It would be a pity to waste all that effort, and I really don't feel I could let you go now without paying your respects to me personally. It would be so rude, and wasn't I just saying, Connie, that you are the soul of courtesy? The voice itself was playing me alive. What was left of my mind and will were addled with the effort to remain myself. Slowly, painfully, I moved my right hand, slid it stickily into my pocket, and closed my gummy and aching fingers around my little knife. It wasn't hot anymore, but the painful pressure of the voice eased a little. I dropped my eyes and threw the smeary muck on my forearms. I could see the occasional gleam of golden webbing. Do walk on, please. That please seemed to last a century. Walking on being precisely what he was trying to prevent us from doing by the non-sound of his voice. I squeezed my knife till I could feel it grinding into my palm and took a step forward. So did Khan. He didn't take my hand again, but as we moved, his shoulder brushed mine. I realized it was important not to appear to be struggling. Khan could probably have moved faster without me, but he didn't. He waited. So I raised my other foot and took another step and another. Khan matched me, and with every step we touched briefly, shoulder or arm or back of hand, there was a sort of quiver against my breast as if the chain that hung there was rearranging itself. You must be tired, said the voice. You are walking so slowly. But I heard it too. He was losing this round as he had lost the first one because we weren't paralyzed and helpless, because I wasn't dying under the scored scal score scourge of his voice. I wondered how much worse it would be if he said my name. It became easier as we went on. He'd withdrawn, I guess, plotting his next move. We didn't get rushed by any minions trying to kill us either. I kept my hand wrapped around my, my knife, and I felt the little hard lump that was the seal against my other leg. The chain felt stretched across my breast like a, a rock climber spread eagled across a particularly tricky slope. I pretended I was going forward bravely, ready for the next challenge, but I'd been wounded by that voice, the bitter burning of acid. My body throbbed with it, despite the talismans, despite the light web. Every step blew a little gust of pain through me. I tried not to shiver, which would only make it worse, and besides, pathetically, I didn't want Khan to despise me. 
As our shoulders brushed, I felt him helping me, offering me his strength. I forgot again that he was a vampire, that I was afraid of him too, that I hated what he could do and had done tonight, hated him for making me find out what I could do. He was also all I had. He was my ally, and if I was going to let him down, which I probably was, at least let me not do it because I just lost it. The silvery luminescence that began eerily to come up around us was genuine light of some sort, light that a human eye could respond to, but there was nothing here I wanted to see that I wouldn't rather be able to trick myself into half-believing I wasn't seeing, that my human neurons were confused by the vampire thing I was infected with. We were in a huge room. There were enormous pipes and the remains of scaffolding and machinery all around the walls and more overhead, some kind of derelict factory. No town was full of them. This one had been renovated in a way. The sickly wash of marsh light gleamed off knobs and rivets, dials and gadgetry that no human had ever invented, let alone put together. I wondered dimly if there was any purpose to them, or if they were merely backdrop, window dressing, the latest vampire version of Bram Stoker's febrile fantasy of ruined castles and earth-filled coffins. Bigger important vampire gangs always had a headquarters, and headquarters usually contained some accommodations for those nights they wanted to change from eating out, and they felt like throwing a dinner party at home. Such a space would be suitably decorated to inspire fervor, adrenaline panic in their visitors, and the word was that techno-degeneracy had been the staging of choice since the wars, although how anyone found this out to report it on the globe net was a mystery. Stoker and his coffins had always been nonsense, but the vampires had borrowed the idea for a century or two as a ruse and scene because it worked. The lack of scarlet lined black capes and funny accents tonight wasn't making me happy. I knew immediately that I didn't like techno-degeneracy either, but I wouldn't have liked earth-filled coffins any better. If there was any surprise, it was that I had any energy left to dislike anything. I was much better off disliking the decor and trying to convince myself I wasn't seeing it anyway. At the far end of the big room, there was a dais, and on that dais sat Bo. I felt his eyes on me. Look at me, they said. It wasn't a voice this time or even a compulsion like to drag like a rope round my neck I had felt earlier. Not looking into his eyes felt like trying to prevent my heart from beating, but I didn't look and my heart continued to beat. The dais was a tall one and on the steps up to it lounged several more vampires. They were all watching us with interest. I could see the glitter of eyes. I wondered if vampire eyes really do glitter, or if it was something to do with the marsh light, or with my dark vision, or with the fact that I'd gone crazy and hadn't figured this out yet. So okay, chances were I wasn't going to stay alive long enough to do any figuring, but I was still alive at the moment, and I was, it seemed ridiculous even as it occurred to me, but I was angry. I'd had my life ruined by this disgusting undead monster. I had nothing to lose. All the best stuff in the books, and sometimes in history too, gets done by people who have nothing left to lose, and so aren't always looking over their shoulders for the way out after it was over. I thought wistfully that I'd rather be looking over my shoulder for the way out, but I wasn't. I was about to die. But if I could take him, the bow thing, with me, it would have been worth it. The thought flamed up in me like the sun coming up over the horizon. Yes, it will be worth it. I took my hand out of my pocket. Now all I had to do was do it.
We reached the bottom of the dais. Those eyes were still pulling at me, deliberately, consciously, voluntarily. I lifted my own eyes and met them. Monster didn't begin to cover it. Ironically, the greeting we'd had from his guard corps had done me a service. I think if I hadn't already been shocked beyond my capacity to handle it, I wouldn't have survived the initial blow of looking into the eyes of the master. Maybe it was a good thing I'd already lost my soul, that I was already half out of my body, my mind, my life, because it meant I wasn't there to meet the full force of Bo's gaze. It was bad enough anyway, the distillation of hundreds of years of evil shimmering in those eyes and his enjoyment of my looking at it. But he also expected me to crack, to disintegrate immediately. He thought that as soon as I looked into his eyes, it would be all over. Never mind that I could apparently look into ordinary vampires' eyes. That had happened occasionally. I saw this in his eyes too and thought, it did? Remember this. The part of me that was looking forward to finishing dying said, what for? Bo was a master vampire. He could destroy vampires with his glare. A mere human would incinerate on the spot. Oh, and his eyes were colorless. Did I say that? I hadn't thought of evil as being without color, but it is. Once you get past plain everyday wickedness, the color is squeezed right out of it. Evil is a kind of oblivion, having destroyed everything on its way there. I did go up in flames, but they weren't the flames he had anticipated. The light web blazed up like a lit fuse running back to the detonator, the bomb, snaking along the ground as it had been laid out. A slender tongue of fire began in a curl on the back of each of my hands. They ran up my arms, licking along the lines of the lattice, across my breast, the chain around my neck flared, into my scalp. I could feel my hair rising, waving in the fire, or perhaps it became fire itself, running down my back, my belly, my legs. The lighting of that fuse was looking into Bo's eyes. I was on fire. I put one flaming foot on the first stair of the dais and stepped up. I was still staring into Bo's eyes. I felt rather than saw the vampires on the dais slither together and descend on Khan. I don't know if they saw me burst into flames or not. I don't know if they were the sort of flames that anyone sees, even vampires. If they did see the light web ignite, presumably they thought it was to do with their master having me well in hand, and they could afford to concentrate on Khan. But Bo gave me another gift as I toiled up the dais stairs toward him, letting me see briefly out of his eyes to the bottom of the dais behind me. I saw the other vampires pull Khan down. The vampires around Bo's dais would be the elite, of course, as the welcoming committee had been the cannon fodder, and as I say, I'm not sure that vampires get tired exactly, but they can come to the end of their strength. I thought now as I flamed, I seemed to hear the roaring of flame too, that Khan might have given me more of his remaining strength than I had realized to get me this far, more than he could spare which meant I had to. I saw one of the vampires bend over him as they pinned him down, its mouth open, things shining. It buried its face in his throat. I saw him jerk and heave, but they had him fast. I saw another vampire delicately unbutton the remains of his shirt, stroke his chest. I saw its vampires reaching under Khan's... I saw its fingers reaching under Khan's breastbone for his heart. It wasn't anything so clear and noble as a decision that since I could do nothing for him, I might as well get on with what I was doing. The Khan was dying in a good cause if I could finish it before I died too. It wasn't a meeting of my strength against Bo's either because Bo was still the stronger. He was going to stop me before I reached him. I was two steps from the summit, the crown where Bo, Bo sat enthroned, and I couldn't go any further. But I still couldn't watch Khan die. I couldn't. Think about cinnamon rolls. Think about the bakery at Charlie's. Feel the dough under your hands and the heat of the ovens. Think about Charlie cranking down the awning. Mom going into the office and flicking on her comm box before she takes off her coat. Think about Mel in the kitchen next door. Think about Pat and Jesse sitting at their table, eating everything that Mary puts in front of them. Think about Mary pouring hot coffee. Think about Mrs. Bialski sitting at her table and Maude sitting across from her. And for a moment I saw them, Mrs. B and Maud. They were holding hands across the table. 
and their faces looked haggard and strained and awful as if they were waiting to hear the news of someone's death, news they were expecting. And then Mrs. B looked up straight at me as she had the day I had been watching her from behind the counter, and Maud looked up too over her shoulder as Mrs. B was looking. Their eyes met mine. Standing behind them, I seemed to see Mel. He held out his arms toward me, and flames leaped from his skin, as if his tattoos were a light web. I took the last two steps. I was standing in front of Beau. But I couldn't bring myself to touch him, to try to touch him. I said that Monster doesn't cover it. There is no word for a several hundred year old vampire who has performed every available wickedness over and over till he has to invent unavailable ones because he'd worn the others out. His flesh was not flesh, it was a viscous ooze held together by malice. His voice was a manifestation of malignancy, for he had no tongue, no larynx. His eyes were the purest imagination of evil, flawless in a way that flesh could never be. I knew that if I touched him, I would be recreated into such as he was. The scar on my breast burst apart and my poisoned blood ran down. I stopped. I stopped trying. But Beau made a mistake. He laughed. I reached into my left hand pocket and took out the daylight charm. I didn't look at it, but I felt the tiny sun spin and blaze, the tree shake its leaves. Yes. The deer raised her head, acknowledging her own death, watching it come toward her. I felt the moving line of the water barrier around its edge. As Beau laughed, I threw the charm down the noisome hole that indicated his mouth. A little tracery of fire followed it like an arrow carrying a rope across a, a, a chasm. The mouth hole closed with a sucking sound, something an ear could hear. What there was that was left of him in the real world wavered and became vulnerable to reality again, as the force and concentration of his will faltered in surprise. Surprise and pain, the fire, my fire, ran up his face, his eyes. No, no, I can't say. But he had been strong and evil and undead for such a long time, and I had been alive and human for such a short time. My little fire wavered and began to ebb. His face writhed. He was about to speak. A hiss. I heard Khan hiss. Vampires did hiss. The giggler had hissed. It was a horrible sound even from a an everyday and every night vampire. It was much worse from Bo, as everything about Bo was worse. But was it a hiss, or was it his attempt to say my name? I was back at the lake where it all began. The sun flamed outside the house. The lake water lapped at the shore. For the first, for that first time, I heard my tree. Yes, perhaps there had been a doe standing in that forest, looking through the trees of the house on her way home, to some dappled place where she would doze till sunset. Beauregard, I shouted, I destroy you, and I put my hands into the mire of his chest and wrenched out his heart. The sky was falling. Ah, okay. Skies don't fall, therefore I was dead. I'd kind of expected to be dead. I felt rather comfortable, really. Relieved. Did that mean I'd succeeded? Succeeded in what? There'd been something I'd been desperate to do before I checked out for the last time. Couldn't quite remember. Sunshine. Why can't you leave me alone? There is a lot of noise. Shouldn't be able to hear anyone saying my name. So I'm not hearing someone saying my name. 
So go away, damn it. I don't want to be here shivering in this polluted body. My hands, my hands touched. I won't remember. I'm not dead yet, I thought composedly, but I am dying. Good. I don't want to spend the rest of my life being careful not to remember. I hope I did whatever it was I wanted to do first. Maybe I could go back just long enough to find out. Sunshine. Khan, on his hands and knees, crouched over me. The floor shook under us, and there was a lot of stuff falling down and flying around. Not a good place to be unless you were dying, which I was. Khan, I wanted to say, don't bother. Let one of these flying chunks of something or other finish the job. I'm tired, and I don't want to hang around. My hands. Sunshine, he said. We have to get out of here. Listen to me. You have undone Bo. He cannot put himself back together. You have succeeded. This is your victory. But there is much of his, his animus, released by the final destruction of his body. This place is being pulled to pieces. I cannot carry you through this. Sunshine, listen to me. I was drifting off again. I paused in the drift, momentarily caught by the sound of Khan's voice. He sounded positively emotional. I wanted to laugh, but I didn't have the energy. I began to drift again. I felt him lift me up. I wanted to struggle, leave me alone, but I didn't have the energy for that either. He rearranged me, leaning against him, one arm around me, the, the other hand cradling my head, tipping it toward his body. Blood. Blood in my mouth. Again. No. I wanted to struggle. I did want to. I could have not swallowed. I could have let it run back out of my mouth again. Khan's blood. This wasn't the blood of a deer this time, a mortal creature killed for me, killed because she was like me, more like me than a vampire, less like me than a vampire. Perhaps by the fact of her death, by the fact that the recently life-worn blood of her had saved my life, that had been a long time ago. I hadn't known what was going on that time. I knew well enough this time. This was Khan's heart's blood, the heart's blood of a vampire. When did I cross the irrevocable line? When I drove out to the lake? When I tucked my little knife into my bra? When I transmuted it into a key? When I unlocked my shackle? When I unlocked Khan's? When I took him into the daylight and stopped it from burning him? When he saved my life by the death of a doe? When I discovered I could destroy a vampire with my hands? When I destroyed Bo with those hands? Or when I agreed to live by drinking Khan's heart's blood? I don't know what happened at the foot of the dais when Bo's crack troop set on Khan while I was climbing the stairs. I don't know if what I saw was entirely some mirage of Bo's to confound and weaken me or whether something like it did happen. I would rather think that some of it did happen, that the wound in his chest was already there when he pressed my mouth against it. This was no mere flesh wound this time, no tiny slash from a tiny blade. I did not want to think of him sinking his own fingers, tearing his own. I lifted my head with a gasp and began to struggle to my feet. He, yielded up, he kneeled up beside me, still that vampire fluency, even after everything that had happened, even with that wound in his chest. He took my hand again and we ran. It takes some coordination running while, some, while holding someone's hand. But if you can get it right, every time your linked hands swing forward, you get a little extra force for that stride. Some of that was the vampire cocktail I had just swallowed. It coursed through me, giving me a strength I knew didn't belong to me. Shouldn't belong to me. Shouldn't be letting me keep struggling, letting me run, letting me use my poisoned hands, clinging to his hand too, or perhaps his clinging to mine. Let me stop thinking about what my hands had recently been doing. So what would it, so would it have been better to die? Too much has happened since my last sunset. Khan may be right that I cannot be turned and that it won't be the daylight that kills me, but the touch of the real world will, whatever the sun is doing. I missed the little hot lump of the seal against my leg. The chain swept back and forth across my breast in time with my running footsteps, but slowly weighted by the thick poisoned blood of the reopened scar. My sun self, my tree self, my dear self, don't they outweigh the dark self? Not anymore. We ran, and a wind like the end of the world howled around us, and huge fragments of machinery, having crumbled apart and fallen, were yanked up again and tossed like bits of paper. I think the roof was caving in as well. It was a little hard to differentiate. There was no trail to follow of dismembered vampire remains or anything else. I don't know how Khan knew which way to run, but he seemed to, and I ran because he was running. 
because it seems like a good thing to do when hunks of flying metal the size of small buses are razoring through the air around you, even though I suppose you're as likely to run into the wrong place at the wrong time as you are to have lingered in the wrong place at the wrong time if you were moving more slowly. For the moment, for just this moment of running, I seem to be committed to the idea of trying to stay alive. Then we were actually running down something that looked like a corridor towards something that looked like double swinging doors. We put our unlinked hands forward to push through, and for a miracle the doors swung back, like normal doors in the real world are supposed to do. We were outside, outside in no town, under a night sky, breathing real air. Maybe I didn't have time to die when I ran back into the real world, or maybe I was too surprised. We ran straight into the arms of a division of SOF. In a way, I was lucky. They recognized me almost immediately. I was hysterical. This was definitely one thing too many. And when I got grabbed by three guys, I did one of them some damage before the other two got a bind on me. I couldn't bear the touch of, well, of flesh against mine, especially against my hands. So it's a good thing they had a bind ready, rather than the old-fashioned routine of spread out on the ground with my hands twisted up behind my back. The bind should have stopped me cold, but I was still full of adrenaline, or dark blood, or the remains of the strength the light web had gathered for me, or poison, or whatever you like, and I thrashed and squirmed like someone having a fit for a minute or two before it stopped me, by which time I'd heard a half-familiar voice say, wait a minute, isn't that, that's Ray from Charlie's, remember she? You have to hand it to the SOF training drill, a mad woman covered in blood runs out of nowhere, promptly tries to maim one of your teammates and then goes off and fits, and this guy had enough presence of mind to make an ID. And then a completely familiar voice, now kneeling beside me as I panted inside the fully expanded vine, saying, Sunshine, Sunshine, can you hear me? I could, just. His voice sounded like it was coming through a filter or a bad phone connection, which might have been the mind. I don't think it was, but it might have been. The person saying, Sunshine, can you hear me, was Pat. I nodded. I wasn't ready to try and say anything. I'm not sure a nod from a person in a bind is very recognizable, but Pat got it. I can let you out of the bind if you promise, if you're okay now. I can let you out of the bind if you promise, if you're okay now. I thought about it. I was lying on the ground. A good mind will prevent you hurting yourself as well as hurting anyone else. And I didn't seem a whole lot worse than I'd been before SOF grabbed me. And from inside a bind, you don't have any responsibilities. Did I want to be let out? Gods and angels, what was happening to Khan? SOF knew me. They might listen to me. I couldn't do con any good foaming at the mouth and being a loony. Couldn't afford to die yet, either. First, I owed it to him to get him out of this, if they hadn't staked him already. Urgency shot through me, tying some of the scattered bits of my personality and will together again. Granny knots, probably, but hey. I said as calmly as I could, yes, okay, I'm a little dizzy. 